This month, the world's toughest solo challenge gets underway. How to build a 60-footer in 60 seconds. Plus, in a World Sailing Show exclusive, we talk to Russell Coots, the architect of the modern America's Cup. The teams that generally say, OK, those were the winning factors last time, invariably come up short. Big news from Barcelona as foiling is confirmed for the next Olympics. But first, once completed, forever hooked. Of the many classic offshore races, there is one that proves irresistible. We visit the Rolex Middle Sea Race to find out why. You only have to do it once to become hooked. And those that have done it before know exactly why they're back. This is the most beautiful race course in the world. I've said that before, and that's a fact. I mean, these, those volcanic islands on a clear day, spectacular. And Scrambley, of course, erupts a little bit. Racing hundreds of miles offshore doesn't usually involve much scenery other than waves and wildlife. But the Rolex Middle Sea Race is different. This taxing 608-mile race around Sicily takes the fleet past some stunning backdrops, including an active volcano. Some describe it as the most beautiful offshore race in the world, others the most demanding. With so many corners, it's a challenging racetrack, with a reputation for changeable weather. Fierce conditions are as likely as flat calm. In 10 minutes, there is no wind along with everything in between. But this year, there was tension and drama of a different kind. Ah! Light conditions are typical for the start from Valletta. This year it was no different as the fleet threaded its way into open water. Once there, the private battles and crusades start to take shape. Among them, Lloyd Thornburg's 70-foot trimaran Fado was out to set another record, to add to their ever-growing list. Giovanni Soldini's Maserati team aboard Fado's sister ship wanted victory too. But arriving in Malta with structural damage, unable to use her foils properly, the odds looked stacked against them, especially given the little practice that the crew had had. Fado's flawless performance from the start, along with their track record this season, confirmed them as the pre-race favourites. But Soldini's team were not out to accept defeat. And when Fado headed for the wrong island to round after Pantelleria, Maserati passed, took the lead, and never gave it back. Fado had turned an 11-mile lead into a 65-mile deficit, while Maserati had turned an opportunity into line honours and a new course record for multi-hulls. Meanwhile, in the monohulls, there were plenty of challenges for last year's line honours winner, George David's Rambler 88. The 82-footer Agir, the 70-footer Trifork and others had Rambler in their sights. David's team still hold the course record set in 2007. And while they couldn't better this blistering record pace, they took Monohull line honours for the second year running. It's a very quiet boat. Nobody raises his voice at all. And uh, we work well together, a lot of camaraderie and, camaraderie and teamwork. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of the joy of sailing is to have a good group of people to do it with. Establishing who had gained overall victory on corrected time turned out to be a more complicated affair. After Rambler had crossed the line, there was still time for the smaller boats to snatch victory. All David and his crew could do was to wait while the smaller boats tried to beat the clock. Among them, Wild Joe, Caro and Maverick had all looked promising at some stage. But after a 13-hour wait, it was Vincento Honorato's Mascalzoni Latino that took the overall IRC Handicap Trophy. 
The top 10 finishers on corrected time ranged in size from 33 to 82 feet long, with double-handed and fully crewed teams. This is offshore racing as it should be, where any size of boat or team can win. And another reason why those that have competed in this race once become hooked. Good evening and welcome to the 2016 Rolex World Sailor of the Year Awards. The short list of nominees read like a who's who of modern Olympic sailing. And while this year the winners had Rio gold in common, their stories were very different. The women's 2016 Rolex World Sailor of the Year. Hannah Mills, Saskia Clark. Hannah Mills and Saskia Clark joined forces in 2010 and set out on their Olympic quest. Uh, shocked, yeah, overwhelmed. Yeah. Sass hasn't stopped giggling. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, just really proud and honoured to have been first of all nominated against all the other amazing nominees and, and yeah, completely shocked to have actually won. Both are fiercely competitive and yet their path to the Olympics started in two different ways. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of sailing at all. Uh, I've got an elder sister who's two years older and she uh, loved it. She was really the driving uh, force like, between my, uh, for my parents to take us around the country and stuff. And I just tagged along, threw stones in the water and tr tried to make any excuse to get out of going sailing. And um, then finally, uh, just sort of had a, a beautiful summer's day, a uh, junior week somewhere. And um, I, I had run out of excuses and uh, got on with it and absolutely loved it. I'd always knew I wanted to be a sportswoman. Uh, I didn't necessarily know in which sport, uh, but I knew I loved sailing and I was obviously very competitive at it. And um, definitely that's probably where I started to realize that the Olympics was a, a potential goal and something to really try and work for. Santiago Langer is no stranger to the games. A six-time Olympian, Langer has two bronze medals and a string of world championships to his name. He's raced around the world and played key parts in several America's Cup campaigns. A qualified yacht designer, he's one of the most experienced professional sailors in the sport. And now he has gold. It's just amazing, you know, I've been surfing a wave of happiness and good vibes since the, the last race of the Games and it seems like it never ends and this is such an honour to receive this prize along such a great nominees and the list of people that won it before that I truly admire and all of them so it's, a, it's an incredible feeling. But his was a story of challenging the odds in a different way. At 54 he was the oldest sailor at the 2016 Games but he had also recovered from losing a lung to cancer just a year before. Together with his crew, Cecilia Carranza Soroli, their hard-fought victory in the NACRA 17 was the story of the Games, and for many, the year. But he still isn't ready to stop. I'm thinking of Tokyo since, since the last day, since I won the medal. I've really, truly been thinking of how to do it, how I manage my body and my mind to arrive there in good shape. My sons are doing it again, so why not? When you win the America's Cup, you get to make the rules. And winning has become a habit for Sir Russell Coots. He's won the America's Cup five times, three times a skipper. His first victory was in 1995, his most recent in 2013. With an Olympic gold, a string of world championship titles, an MBE, a CBE and a knighthood, Coots is a highly decorated sailor. Today, he is chief executive of the organizing body for the 35th America's Cup. But his reputation hangs on more than simply pointing a boat in the right direction. In 2010, he swapped the wheel for the reins and announced a bold, ambitious and controversial vision for the next America's Cup, the move to catamarans. Since then, the game has moved on even further with high-speed foiling cats, all of which has influenced a generation of new boats and sailors. 
I'm surprised at how quickly it's, it's impacted parts of the sport. And, and not only the boats that are actually coming out of the water on foils, even the displacement boats that are using foil arrangements to, to improve their performance. One of the things that I'm surprised that's happened so fast is the, is the interest in audience. Non-sailors watching this racing, actually following it, getting excited by it. I didn't think we'd have uh, even ticketed events this, this rapidly, but it's, it's happened and it's already successful. And more changes are on the way. In one month, the new race boats will be launched, marking the start of yet another cup chapter. They're just much more refined, and, and the, the AC World Series boats are they're pretty dated now in, t in terms of their technology, whereas the, the modern boats are, are, are really, they are absolutely state-of-the-art. By May next year, the fruits of their labour will be on show as the next America's Cup kicks off in Bermuda. I think the actual the geometry of the boats, the wings, even to a large extent the geometry of the, of the foils will not be that different actually. I think, I think it'll be the use of all this equipment that will see the significant differences. So what will win the America's Cup? Well I think it's true that the winning factors for each America's Cup cycle are always different. You know, um, there are some common denominators like obviously teamwork and and you know general philosophies of leadership or the way you might you know, put the program together. And the teams that generally say, okay, that, those, those were the winning factors last time, therefore let's gear our operation around that for the future, invariably come up short because it, it always requires fresh thinking. The bottom line is that the America's Cup game has been raised. If you compare even the Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series boats to the America's Cup class, the America's Cup class boats manoeuvre in you know, a factor of probably 10 times better than, than these boats. And that's going to improve the quality of the racing again. So I think the sport is, is in still very much in the development phase. Which suits Coots down to the ground. Looking to the future is what makes him tick. After the break, the world's toughest solo race kicks off. How to build a 60-footer in 60 seconds. Plus, big news from Barcelona. But first, he stood on his keel and jumped off the top of his mast. But round the world sailor, Alex Thompson, had at least one more idea for a breathtaking start. He stood on his keel and jumped off the top of his mast. Alex Thompson had at least one more idea before he headed off around the world. A keen kite surfer and a highly accomplished sailor, Thompson decided to combine both for his biggest stunt. The Vendée Globe race has a brutal reputation. Single-handed, non-stop, without assistance around the world, this 24,000-mile offshore epic will take three months to complete. But not everyone makes it. Based on previous races, only half of them will complete the course. On the 6th of November, 29 competitors cross the start line off Les Sables de on the west coast of France. The dash south to the equator on the opening leg was in perfect conditions. And after one week, there were no retirements. The new boats proved how powerful they are in the right conditions, especially Alex Thompson's Hugo Boss. After an earlier tactical hiccup, the British sailor was playing catch-up, reeling in the leaders at an impressive rate and demonstrating why his boat is considered to be so potent but he made even bigger gains when negotiating the Cape Verde Islands. It's, uh, haven't really lost the wind so far. All is good, pleased to be in second. Not sure I'm gonna be in second for long. Uh, we'll see uh, how it all pans out after these jibes are done. 
That's it for now. While others passed to the west, Thompson passed between the islands, a move that gave him the lead. From there, he was first into the doldrums and, crucially, first out. As he threaded his way through the light breezes, he left Sebastian Jos and others wallowing in a windless hole. Further back in the fleet, others were dealing with gear breakages. So you see here, the masthead, it's broken right here. I'm not far from Cape Verde, so I'll try and stop there to see if there are solutions. And Kajiro Shireishi had blown out a Genoa. Meanwhile, those with the new, more powerful horizontal foils were starting to come to terms with a new level of discomfort, as Jeremy Bayou explained. It's very noisy. It makes the whole boat shake. It goes through your whole body. The vibrations are like being at the dentist. It's simply unbearable. So if you don't put your earmuffs on after 20 minutes, it's like bashing your head against the wall. But for all the competitors, the first week of racing marked an important step in a plan that has taken years to achieve. Some had built a new boat specifically for the event. Their campaigns had started with 10,000 hours of design, 30,000 hours in build, involving over 100 people. And here's what Jean-Pierre Digue's boat looked like in build in 60 seconds. Offshore foiling came a step closer after America's Cup champion Jimmy Spithill and his crew of six completed the 660-mile offshore passage from New York to Bermuda aboard F4, their 46-foot foiling catamaran. The bright green record machine has been at it again. The second of two record claims around the Isle of Wight has been ratified by the World Sailing Speed Record Council. Owner Lloyd Thornburg and his crew have also claimed a new record from Monaco to Porto Cervo. They completed the 185-mile course in just under eight hours. World Sailing has elected a new president. Kim Anderson from Denmark won the vote at the Federation's annual conference. I know there's a lot of work to do, but I'm ready to lead this organization forward. Anderson replaces Carlo Croce. As the 60-footers in the Vendée Globe race each other around the world, Italian sailor Gaetano Mura is attempting to set a new record time in a 40-footer. Barcelona was the venue for World Sailing's New Look annual conference. There was plenty to discuss and debate. And two big topics in particular. The first, that foiling is in for the next Olympic Games. Really excited times and uh, World Sailing really wants to uh, move on and uh, move ahead with uh, full foiling uh, NACA 17 uh, high performance cap to, uh, to 2020 Tokyo. Um, and we came up with uh, the solution of having four foils in the water. Uh, you will be sailing in upwind conditions and in the downwind conditions with all four boards down. Clearly a big move, but how and when will the transition take place? So what we are supplying to, uh, to, the, to the current boat owners is a, a retrofitting kit. They can upgrade their boats at minimum cost. And uh, we probably see in the summer 2017 the first event uh, where all teams will be fully foiling on the NACA 17 and uh, well, I invite you to be there because it's going to be a show. Paralympic sailing has been a hot topic since the shock announcement that it will be dropped from the Tokyo Games. A detailed plan to get parasailing reinstated was unveiled by parasailing manager Massimo Dige. 
Part of that plan involves new classes. We are looking to change uh, two classes, the SCAD and the SONAR, but we are thinking also at a new format of racing. It's a total review of uh, Paralympic regatta. But what are the chances of success and what is the timescale? We had a meeting with the IPC and we had now a clear plan of uh, what to do to be included. If we do our, our best, I think we have an opportunity to present uh, probably the bid uh, to be reinstated in uh, spring uh, 2018 and the decision will be in uh, January 2019 probably. But aside from the committees and conferences, the event played host to many of the world's top sailors, including some of the 2016 Olympic medalists. <laughs> Many of them live, train, eat and travel together. But how well do they really know each other? We ran a small test to find out. <laughs> Who's the worst at keeping secrets? I don't know. <laughs> Who has the biggest appetite? I get hangry sometimes. Woo! Who's the luckiest? Hmm. Boat. No, you can't have both. I always find coins in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Who gets the worst hangovers? <laughs> Who buys the best presents? Next month, it's crunch time in Japan for the last America's Cup World Series. Russell Coots talks of the future for foiling and the America's Cup. Plus, we head to Melbourne, Australia for the final sailing World Cup of 2017.